I wanted to give you a quick tour through the first assignment because it includes quite a few concepts that are going to be new to you. So we're, we're, we're learning JavaScript. We're, this week we're talking about functions and um, just the basic control, control structures within the language and data types and whatnot. And so your first assignment is going to give you a chance to practice doing all of that. So when you're learning a modern programming language, there is so much to learn because there's the language itself and people are fond of saying um, this particular language is a, uh, it's a small language and there's only so many keywords and it's pretty, you can learn it in a weekend. But the trouble is you never just learn a language. You, you have to learn the language. You have to learn the tools that you use. That might be a compiler or you know static analysis tools or whatever it is. Then you have to learn the ecosystem. So you have to learn about things like package managers and how to install things and how to use modules and all sorts of things like that. And uh, then you have to learn these best practices and these things that nobody tells you. And so what I wanna do is I wanna give you a realistic uh, JavaScript project to work on for your first project. So what I could do is I could shield you from all the complexities of the web. And I could say to you, I just want you to write a program and we're not, we're, we're going to ignore absolutely everything in the real world. But I don't think that's helpful. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw you into what is a more realistic style of JavaScript program. And I'm going to ask you to do a bit of work in there. And I am going to try and explain and take you through the pieces of it. So the first thing I would say to you is, uh, if you have questions as you're going, make sure you ask your questions. You, it, It's going to be, every single one of you is going to find something in here confusing. All of you are going to find things that are new. And that's okay. So I just want to put it out there that what we're doing here is we're learning. And it's okay to not know how something works or to be confused by it or to get stuck. So let me just walk you through what's going on here. So what I have is I have the first assignment. Uh, I downloaded the zip file and uh, I get something that looks like this. I'm on a Mac. You might be on Windows. For what we're going to do, it doesn't matter. The tools are all going to work on every platform. So this is what my project looks like. I've got a source folder and I've got a bunch of files. So the first thing you're gonna notice about how JavaScript projects and web projects are typically created is that they're gonna be in a folder. So we're not gonna work with a single file. We're gonna work with a whole bunch of files. I want you to get used to that mindset. When I get a lot of students in the course, they tend to think about, I'm gonna open a file and I'm gonna work on a file. You don't do that. You're going to open an entire project. You're going to open a whole bunch of files and you're going to work with them as a, as a collective. So what I see here is I see a bunch of configuration files in the root of my project. And then I have a whole bunch of source files over here. I'm actually not seeing all of the files. So let me show you what I mean. If I look at all of the files that are in here, you can see there's a bunch of files I have that have a dot in front of them. So dot ESLint. Uh, rcjs dot get ignore dot prettier rc dot js dot vs code so all of these dot files this is a standard thing from the unix world where any file name beginning with a period is a hidden file and if i just do a normal directory listing i won't see them so i have to look for the hidden files to see those so um, let's talk about how you would start coding this what i want you to do i'm going to switch views here on the right, I've got Visual Studio Code and it's sitting there. And one of the things that you'll notice it says in the middle, it says open file or folder. And on my Mac, that's command O for you. That's probably control O if you're on um, Linux or on Windows. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go to file and open. And what I wanna do is I wanna open up that entire project. So here's the assignment one folder and I'm gonna open that folder. Okay, so when, when I open this folder, I'm going to see all of these different files that I was just telling you about. So I've got in the root, I've got a bunch of hidden files. Then I've got my source directory. I've got a .vs code directory, etc. So let's talk about what you need to do in order to get started on this. Okay, so in the instructions for the assignment, the first thing that it's going to talk about is that you need to install dependencies. So when you're doing any kind of web project, 
any kind of JavaScript project, you're going to need to install other third-party code. So I told you in the lecture this week that people write functions and they distribute functions as a third party because the JavaScript language doesn't have a very big standard library. So all of the extra functionality of things that you might wanna do, you have to download and those have to be installed on your machine. So let's talk about how you do this. I've asked that you install um, Node.js and hopefully you have Node installed on your machine. If you do and it's set up properly, you should be able to run Node and figure out whichever version of Node that you have installed. Okay, so when you install Node, a second program gets installed called NPM and you can try looking for it too. NPM dash dash version shows me that I have version 6.14.8 on here. So NPM is, <clears throat> excuse me, the Node Package Manager. Node Package Manager. And it actually, there's a website for it, npmjs.com. And this is a huge registry of packages that you can download and install and use in your projects when you're gonna when you're gonna make a new project. So what I have done is I have built out a um, I've built out a JavaScript project and I want you to install all of the dependencies. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this today, but there's a file in your um, in the root of your folder called package.json. I'll just click on it and show you what it looks like. Package.json is a file that has a bunch of dependencies that are defined. So I am using all of these dependencies to make your project, this first assignment work, and you need to have them installed on your computer. So how do I install the dependencies that are defined in here? For example, we're gonna be using something called Jest, and you can see here that it wants version 26.4.2 of this, of this project. So if I was to go to NPM, just out of interest, and I was to type jest, you'll see that uh, jest comes up as one of the packages. I click on that package and it tells me that this package, is, this package was downloaded this many times this week. So you can see that lots and lots of people are using it. And it gives me various information about the package, some documentation about it, etc. So what I wanna do in order to install packages in a web project, I have to do the following. Number one, I have to be in the right directory. So you wanna be inside of a terminal and you want to go to the directory where your assignment is sitting. So for me, that's this assignment one, uh, assignment one directory. And I wanna be in the same folder as my package lock and my package.json file. So basically if you're sitting next to those files, this is gonna work. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna run the following command. You're gonna say npm install. And I'll press enter and let that begin. What npm install is gonna do is it's going to read the information in my package, my package.json file that says these are all of the dependencies that are needed for this project. It's gonna go and it's gonna download those dependencies and it's also gonna go and download all of the dependencies for those dependencies. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna make sure that I have all of the program, all of the software that I need in order to be able to run this project. So it's typical in a web programming project to run npm install over and over and over again. Every project you work on is gonna have a set of dependencies and you're gonna to have to go and install various things. Now, we're not really gonna be talking about Node.js and npm extensively in this course. You're gonna do that in your next course in 322. But I wanna introduce you to the ideas because it's, it's nearly impossible in 2020, um, it's impossible for you to uh, work on the web and not use Node or NPM because so, so much of it is um, third-party software that we need to install. So what this tells me is that it's added 1,030 packages, which sounds crazy. So let's just figure out what happened. So um, you'll notice that over here, I have a new folder called node modules. And if I do an LS here, you'll see that I have this new folder called node underscore modules. So when you do an NPM install, it's going to create the node modules folder in your current directory. 
So the way that Node works is it, it always downloads and installs dependencies locally into a project folder. So you can install things globally, but we don't tend to do that. We tend to install the specific version that we need in, uh, in a particular project. So if I look, let's take a look at node modules. If I go into the node modules folder and I do an LS, you can see that there's all kinds of folders in here. Look at them all. Um, if I did a count, so 477 different modules in here. If I look over here, you'll see that I have all of these different, all of these different modules are over here. And if I scroll through this list, you'll notice, for example, that Jest is there. Here's Jest that we just talked about a second ago. So it's taking care of downloading and installing all of these modules. Now, let me say something about the node modules folder. If I were to delete it, uh, that's fine. So I could uh, get rid of the node modules folder. And I'm gonna tell my editor, sometimes the editor I find needs to be told to refresh itself if, if things have changed and it doesn't see the difference over here. So if I lose the node modules folder or I delete it or something happens, I can always get it again by just running npm install. So npm install is always safe to run. It will always go and download and make sure that everything that is supposed to be in the node modules folder is in the node modules folder. So if you try and run something and it says that it can't find a dependency or it's missing something, there's a good chance that you need to run npm install in order to get this. And remember, you have to run npm install in the same location as your package.json file. Okay, so we have this installed. So what that's going to allow me to do is uh, work on starting to write my code. Now let me talk to you about how this code is structured. All right, so all of the code that we're going to work on is in the source folder. And if you go and click on the file solutions.js, this is where you are going to be placing all of your code. And what I've done is I've created a lot of documentation in here to explain how things work. And I want to just take you through and show you how you are going to approach this project. Essentially what this project is about is I want you to implement various functions. So I have a whole bunch of functions that are missing their code, right? So as you scroll through this list, you're going to see a whole bunch of functions and they're all missing their implementation. And what you're going to do is you're going to write the code to implement these functions. Now above each one of these functions, there is a big comment block. Like for example, here's problem six and you can see I have a big comment here that explains how this function is supposed to work. So it tells you, this is what I want it to do. If you pass in this data, I want it to return that data. Every one of these functions does this. Now, what you're also gonna notice is that I've named all of these problems. So for example, this is problem zero, this is problem one, etc. And you're gonna see that there's a whole bunch of other files in the source directory, problem zero, problem one, etc. Let's take a look at problem zero. Notice too that they all end in .test.js. So what I have done is I have written a whole bunch of what are called unit tests. So this, let me just jump back here for a second. This framework Jest that I was mentioning before is one of the, one of the most popular frameworks for writing what are called unit tests or writing tests, automated tests in JavaScript. So what I have done is I've written a bunch of code which is going to use the functions that you write and check if they do what they're supposed to do. So I have these automatic tests that figure out whether things work the way that they should. Now inside of problem zero, I explain how to use this, how you're going to run it. But I wanted, I wanted to walk you through and show you what it's gonna look like. So how do I run the tests for my project? In the assignment instructions, it tells you that you can use the npm test command, npm test. So the, the npm command is used for installing dependencies, 
but it's also used to do a whole bunch of other things like run my tests. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna say npm test and press enter. And it's gonna go and look for any tests that are in the current project and it's gonna start running them. And as it runs them, it's going to report to me anything that is failing. So what I can see right away, if I look at the bottom down here, is that 84 tests failed, one test passed, and 85 tests ran in total. And you can see up above, you can see all of these tests and you can see that they're failing. So for example, let's look at this right here. It says problem one, it says it expected to receive ABC, but instead it received undefined. So I wanna talk about how to read this and how to understand what's going on. Now, what I just did when I run those tests, NPM test, that is going to run all of the tests. So you're gonna run, in this case, 85 different tests. And when you're working on this project, you're gonna find that running all of the tests is gonna be overwhelming because I, I'm not working on, let's say that I'm only working on problem zero. So I'm working on the very first problem here, problem zero. I don't care about all the other ones right now. I just wanna focus in on that one test. So if I wanna run just a single test, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say NPM test, but instead of pressing enter, I'm going to say problem dash zero dot test like that. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use the name and I'm gonna press enter. This time what it's gonna do is it's only going to run problem zero test.js and it's gonna print out whatever, whatever passed or failed and you're gonna see that one failed, one passed and two total tests were run. All right, so let's look at these, let's look at these tests. So this function, greeting, is supposed to take a name and it's supposed to return a greeting, hello and that person's name. And so um, let's talk about why this is failing. So I'm gonna go and look at problem zero dot test. So inside problem zero dot test, there's a bunch of code and you don't have to write this code, but I wanna teach you at least how to read it so you understand what's going on in here. This is JavaScript code and I've written these unit tests and the unit tests describe how the greeting function should work. So the first thing I do is I specify, I describe my tests. So that's problem zero greeting function. And you can see that when my tests run, they print that out that message. So the, the description or the describe that I'm using here is part of jest and it's a, it's a function that defines a set of tests, in this case for problem zero. Inside of this, I have two tests. Here's the first test, here's the second test. The first test says that greeting should be a function. So I have written a little bit of code that says that I expect the type of greeting to be a function. And the way that these tests are written, they look a lot like, I mean, it almost looks like an English sentence. They're meant to be hopefully pretty easy to read. Um, and this test is actually passing. So if you go over here and look in my test results, you'll see that I have a green check mark beside greeting should be a function. So that test is actually working. So that's the one test that is passing. However, you can see that just below that, there's another test that is failing. Greeting should return the correct string output. And you can find that test over here Greeting should return the correct string output. So let's see what this code is doing. I define a variable called result and I call the greeting function and I pass in web222 student as the name. And then I expect that this result, I expect that it should be equal to this string right here. So I'm gonna call your function, I'm gonna get back a result and then I'm gonna compare the result that I get back to what I think it should be. So that's how I write a test. So when I'm interested in knowing if my code works, I can automatically check to see, does this function, given a certain input, produce a given output? Okay, so what's the problem? Let's go look over here at what we, what we see. So this test is failing, and it says, it expected to get what is in red, the received value, 
and it expects it to be this yellow value. So you can see down below, it says, I expect it to get hello web22 student exclamation point, but what I actually got was hello web222 student, and it's missing that exclamation point. Why is it missing that exclamation point? So now we go back to our code, we go back to the implementation, and we look at the greeting function. So here's the greeting function, and the greeting function says, take a name argument and return this string, this template literal, which says return hello space, and then this variable name is gonna be interpolated into the string. But I notice that it's missing, it's missing the ex exclamation point that the test is expecting. So I'm gonna try making a change. I'm gonna change that function, I'm gonna add the exclamation point, I'm gonna save it, and then I'm gonna try rerunning my test. So npm test problem zero test.js. Now that's great. So after I made that change, it's now, when I run the test, that test is passing. So you can see that I ran two tests, both tests are passing. That's great news. So what I wanna do is I wanna work my way through all of these problem sets, and I wanna try and get all of these functions to pass all of the tests. I've got 85 that I have to do. A lot of the tests are really small, simple things. So a given function might have five or six different tests. I'm testing, what if I do this? What if I do that? I'm making sure that all of the different cases work. Now, what if I made a mistake and I reintroduced the bug? What if I did this and I, I saved this? And, or what if I accidentally forgot to put the um, second L in hello? What would happen? Let's rerun the test. Okay, so it comes back and it says, I expected to get hello with two Ls, but I only got one L, so the, the test doesn't work. Now, when you're working on one of these problems, what you're gonna do is you're gonna run the test over and over and over again. So it's handy to be able to have Jest automatically run the test for you. So what you can do, there's another command you can, you can use, and this is in the assignment information. You can say npm run test watch, and you can give the name of the test you wanna watch. So problem zero dot test. So here's what's happened this time. It ran my test, but if I go in here and I make a change to my code, if I put in another L and if I save the file, as soon as I save the file, you'll see that the test ran again and now it's working. And if I broke the test and I ran the test again, it's broken. If I put it, if I fix it and I save the file, it's, 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 it's good and the test passes. To get out of this, I can press Q. So the command that I ran was, npm run test dash, dash watch and then the name of the file that I wanted to um, watch. So when it when Jest watches a file, it's watching to see if the file has changed. If the file changes, it reruns those tests. So you can use this technique. If I wanted to run all of the problem one tests, I would say problem one, npm run test watch problem one dot test it'll run the test and it'll tell me, okay, there are five failing tests. And if I scroll up, it shows me that all five of these tests are currently failing. And then it explains the problem for each one of them. So you can see each one of the tests is color coded here. As I go down, I can see what's going on. If I made a change to any of these, then I could try and get these tests to pass. So that's the game. This is this is really, a, you can think of it as a video game. I want you to, instead of working with a joystick or a VR helmet, you're gonna work with code. I want you to get all of these tests to pass when you're, uh, when you're going through this code and, and make sure that you can get your code to do all of the things that it's supposed to do. Okay, so let me talk about a couple of other things. I also want you to learn to use a couple of other tools. Now, I wanna show you what they are so you understand before we go any further. So the first tool I wanna to talk about is a tool called Prettier. Prettier is a tool that allows you to take source code that looks like this 
And hopefully you don't write source code that looks like this, but take a look at how this is poorly uh, written. Like we've got too much space here. Here we have um, the, the angle bracket should be on this line, but it's not on the right line. Console should be indented. There should be a semicolon here, et cetera, et cetera. There should be a space between the E and the bracket. This is the opposite of prettier. This is a mess. Now down below, you can see the exact same code after being run through prettier. And so what it's done is it's taken the code and it's cleaned it up. So that no matter what kind of code you write, so if I were to put in a bunch of spaces here, you can see that that's not changing the output down here. If I change this to name two, you can see that it updates the code down here. So whatever I whatever I write here, it's it's going to it's going to clean it up for me. So there's a couple of ways for you to use Prettier in this project. Uh, in in my code, for example, if I put this uh, line of code way down here. If I save the file, it will automatically run prettier on the file and clean it up. So if I had like a whole bunch of extra space here, if I save this file, you'll see that I have the prettier, because I have the prettier, let me find it. I have the prettier extension installed in Visual Studio Code. I have prettier integrated into into Visual Studio Code. And because of the way that I've set up this project, it will automatically format your code for you when you save it. So if you want, you can let Prettier run on your code automatically every time you save your file. Another thing I can do is I can run Prettier from the command line. So I can say npm run Prettier. And if I do that, what it'll do is it will go through all of my files and it will reformat the files so that they're all nice and clean. So that's prettier. Another tool we're gonna use here is a tool called ESLint, and I wanted to show you how it does what it does. I've got a piece of code right here. Take a look at this code. I define a function called check. Check takes, let me make this a bit bigger. Check takes a value, and then I check to see if the value is greater than eight. If it is, I return true. Otherwise, I return false. So I want to check if a, if a number is greater than eight or not. Now, you'll notice there's a bunch of red underlines here. ESLint is a tool for finding what are called linting errors. These are errors where you've made certain kinds of programming mistakes that can lead to bugs. So you might have already caught one of the errors right away. So you see this right here, value with an E, but notice that I forgot to put an E here. So you can see that ESLint has come up with a couple of errors. It says value is defined, but it's never used. And then it also says value without an E is not defined. So look at this. It says you defined a variable value that you never used. That's probably a good indication that something is wrong. And you also used a variable called value with no E and you never defined it. So that's not technically wrong as far as JavaScript is concerned. However, it's probably wrong in terms of how you would logically program your code. So what I have to do to fix this bug is I need to correct and say value with an E, value with an E. And you can see that both of those check marks go away. Now it says to me, I'm missing a semicolon on line three at position 16. So I go and I look on line three, and sure enough, I am missing a semicolon right here. So if I put a semicolon in, ESLint is happy. Now it gives me one last error. It says, you have an unnecessary else statement after your return on line four. So we go up and look, and it says, if the value is greater than eight, return true, else return false. And ESLint is right. I guess I don't really need to put an else after I put a return, I can actually get rid of that indenting and I can write my code like that. When I do, you can see that I get a lint-free program. So really, you can think of ESLint almost like spell checking for code. It's not looking for spelling mistakes, it's looking for coding mistakes that you might make. And if you have ESLint installed, as I do, so you install the ESLint extension, it will automatically lint your code while you're typing it. So in the editor, when you're typing your code in solution.js, whenever you are, whenever you make a, some kind of a mistake, 
it will tell you. Like for example, here, value is in gray. And it says value is declared, but its value is never read. So this value, um, it's saying you have a variable here that's not being used. It's not being used because we haven't written that code yet. But after you write your code, you wanna make sure that you don't have any linting errors that are in here. How do I run ESLint from the command line? You can probably already guess. NPM run ESLint. So I ran prettier with NPM run prettier. I'm gonna run ESLint with NPM run ESLint. It's gonna go through all the JavaScript files in this project and it's gonna tell me if there's any problems. And you see that it has found 14 problems, a whole bunch of variables that are defined but never used. Now, right now, these errors are not really a problem. These errors exist because we haven't written any code. As soon as you start writing your code, it's going to uh, clean those up. But when you're done, you, you wanna make sure before you hand in your project that your project is free of linting errors, that all the tests pass, and that the code has been formatted with Prettier. Now, to help you along, I have created a command when you go to hand in your assignment. When you are all done, what I want you to do is I want you to write npm run prepare submission. And when you do this, I'll just run it right now, it's gonna do a whole bunch of things. It's going to run prettier on your code and clean everything up. It's going to create a submission folder it's going to run the unit tests and make sure that they work, and it's gonna log that to a file. It's going to run ESLint and make sure that it works, and it's gonna log that to a file. And it's going to create a zip file for you that you can upload to Blackboard to hand in your project. So I'll let this finish and I'll show you. So right now it's running the tests. So we tend, we, we, we do lots of automation when we're doing web projects to help us so we don't have to uh, do things manually. So this thing came back and it gives me lots of errors because things are failing. So if I go into my submission folder, inside the submission folder, what do you see? Well, you can see that all of the source files have been copied in here. So whatever code you wrote has been copied in here. You'll see that there is a file called test.log test.log has the output of running npm test. So when you hand this in, it's gonna automatically submit, a, it's gonna submit the result of running the tests so that it's obvious what happened when the tests were run. There's also eslint.log and it has, a, it has the result of running eslint so that it's clear what linting problems remain. This file should be empty, there should be no linting errors and the test log should have all passing tests. There shouldn't be any failing tests when you hand it in. So you'll, you'll hand in, if I were to um, look here, you'll hand in this zip file, submission.zip. That's the thing that I want you to hand in when the, when the project goes in. Okay, so how do you get started on this? Install the dependencies, and I want you to begin by reading through all of these instructions read all of this documentation and it'll tell you how to do more of the things that I want you to do. Take a look at each one of the problem sets. Each one of these uh, tests tells you what it's looking for. It expects certain things to be true and you've got to make all of these tests pass. If there's anything that you're unclear on, make sure that you ask. So it's okay to have questions, especially in a time where we're not face to face. Uh, the reason I've made this video is because I can't be with you in class to take you through and answer your questions. So I wanted to make sure that you had a good sense of what's involved in um, starting into this project. If you have any problems, let me know. Otherwise, have fun. Enjoy your new video game of getting unit tests to pass. And um, let's see how you do.